This is the video lecture on changes and error analysis. Now whenever we have to make changes in accounting, the changes can be different types, different categories. We're actually going to have three of these. The first would be change in accounting principle, second change in accounting estimate, and third change in reporting entity. And we're going to talk about each one of these in more detail. So the first type of change would be a change in accounting principle. Now for this to be truly a change in principle, it would have to be a change from one gap approved principle to another gap approved principle. And there's lots of different instances in which that would happen. So a pretty basic example, think about inventory. We know that every time we calculate the value of inventory, we have many different options to choose from. We actually have four different options, FIFO, LIFO, weighted average, and specific identification. All four of those methods are considered totally gap approved and appropriate to use. So say for example, we were using the LIFO method and for whatever reasons we felt that we would like to make a change to the FIFO method. Maybe we feel that method is more appropriate for our company. We could do that, and that would be simply a change in accounting principle because we're changing from one gap-approved principle to another that is also gap-approved. So as long as you're using something that's okay according to gap, you can't go wrong on changing principle. You just have to document the change. Second type of change is change in accounting estimate. And even though we try to be as objective as possible in accounting, sometimes we do have to make estimates. And when we make an estimate, we try to make that estimate in good faith. We try to use our experience and our expertise to make a good estimate. But sometimes circumstances change and we may find that our original estimate needs to be revised. So for example, what if we had a depreciable asset and we estimated a five-year useful life and we decide, you know what, we have to change it to a four-year life. It's not going to last as long as we thought. Well, that's a classic example of a change in estimate because the original estimate was made properly, but due to new information, new circumstances, you had to revise it. So it's okay to do that, but we do have to account for it. So to see this in an example, we have a business here that owns equipment. The equipment had cost $100,000. There is no salvage value. The useful life was estimated to be 10 years. After five years of depreciation, we now feel that it's only going to last another two years. So that's just a simple change in estimate. How will we account for that? Well, what were we doing? The original cost, 100000 The original lifespan, 10. So that means we were depreciating this by $10,000 every year. It then said we were five years into the situation. So we've taken $50,000 worth of depreciation already. So that leaves another 50000 of depreciation yet to be taken. We thought it was going to last for five more years and if that was the case we would keep using the 10,000 but unfortunately now we realize the asset is not going to last as long as we originally thought. Only going to last two more years. So what we'll do is just revise the depreciation. We'll divide that by the two more years 25,000 and now in these last two years Instead of taking $10,000, we'll take $25,000 in depreciation. So we just revise that and catch it up to the, the new estimate. And that's based on new information and based on the fact that the asset is simply not going to last as long as we originally thought. And then the third type of change is a change in reporting entity. And this means that the business itself changes. So maybe you merge with another company. Maybe you are bought by another company. Maybe you have invested in another company 
to such a degree that you have to consolidate. So if that's the case, you would actually have to change the entire set of financial statements and merge the two companies together. So that's a change in reporting entity. Now moving on from changes to, a, to the category of errors, we definitely have to talk about errors. As we know, everyone's human, everybody makes mistakes, accountants certainly make mistakes, and any error that is discovered should definitely be corrected. And I know that in the past, in past videos, we have talked about materiality. We've talked about the level of error. But to be honest, that only applies to audits. When it, when it comes to actually analyzing your errors, it doesn't matter if it's material or not. Even if you find a one penny error, you want to fix it. So all errors that are discovered have to be fixed. Now, when we find these errors, what kind of errors are they going to be? They could be counterbalancing or non-counterbalancing. If it's a counterbalancing error over the course of two reporting periods, it's going to balance itself out. But if it's non-counterbalancing, it will never balance out. And of course, if it's counterbalancing, and we've already gone through two complete reporting periods, we don't do anything because it's already balanced out. Otherwise, though, we do have to fix the error. Now, when we fix these errors, how are we going to fix them? We're going to fix these utilizing our retained earnings. Because think about it. Retained earnings is that one component of capital that represents previous earnings. So that's going to be a way for us to go back and make these corrections. And always remember, retained earnings is debit negative and credit positive. So that'll help you make the decision about how to do the journal entries. So we're going to have an example here of an error. And this is a pretty common error that could be made. We have a business here that has forgotten to accrue $1,000 worth of wages. So assuming that we have realized, that's really the key to it, is you have to realize that the mistake was made. And assuming that, we're going to correct that with the journal entry. So since it was $1,000 worth of wages, we will have a $1,000 journal entry. And notice I'm debiting retained earnings. I'm crediting wages expense. Why am I doing that? Well, think about it. Retained earnings is debit negative, credit positive. Well, see, I forgot to show the wages, so that's money that I'm losing. So that's why retained earnings is debited, to show that it's a reduction of our retained earnings. So that would be the proper way to correct an error. And in the next video, we're going to do a video demo, and we actually will have a whole series of different errors that we have to correct.